Good morning, everyone. Today we'll hear from Commissioner Pichuk for a weekly modeling update and then a health update from Dr. Levine. As you'll see across our nation and across our region and in Vermont, we're still experiencing concerning trends, sporadic case counts with hospitalizations and deaths on the rise. But even with vaccinations underway and the light at the end of the tunnel in sight, it's more important than ever to follow public health guidance to protect the most vulnerable and our healthcare system in general. Every day we vaccinate more elderly Vermonters, protecting those who are least likely to survive if they get COVID because they're more at risk. And I believe we have a moral obligation to take care of them first. That's why each of us must do our part to ensure as many of them as possible have the opportunity to be vaccinated. Now is not the time to let up on our work to slow the spread of the virus. The actions we take, like wearing masks and avoiding gatherings, will directly impact how many Vermonters we can save as vaccines make their way to these most vulnerable amongst us. As we've discussed in previous briefings, this is why we're taking an age-based approach in the next phase of our vaccine rollout. Because as the data and science show, the older you are, the more vulnerable you are to severe risks and death from COVID. Saving lives must be our priority. It's why we've sacrificed so much over these last 10 months. As we work to get shots in arms as quickly as possible, we know having a clearly defined, flexible, easily understood, and accessible vaccination plan is critical. With our based on age plan, we'll see the number of deaths decrease, even if the number of cases remain at the current rate. This will allow us to begin reopening the economy again and start making our way back to some sort of normalcy. But again, now is not the time to let up. And I'm hopeful Vermonters will understand why this strategy is so important and continue to do all we can to help. Now, switching gears, as you might know, when Congress finally passed another COVID relief package, they also extended the Paycheck Protected Protection Program known as PPP, and made it more flexible. Last spring and summer, PPP was an important program that helped keep businesses open and Vermonters employed. Uh, now, Vermont lenders made over 12,000 loans, many forgivable, that totaled over $1.2 billion. The SBA has now opened initial applications for both first-time applicants and employers in need of a second loan. It can be found at sba.gov. And just like the first time around, the lending itself is being managed by banks and other lenders, not the state or federal government. It's important to note, as of today, the SBA has launched the program only for specific lending institutions. So most employers won't be able to submit their applications just yet. But we hope later this week, the rest of the banks and lenders will go live. In the meantime, it's important to be ready, so fill out your applications now. We uh, recommend that employers contact their bank or credit union to see if they're planning to participate in this round and start pulling together the needed financial information so you're ready to submit as soon as your institution starts accepting applications. Because remember, these funds are first come, first serve, so be prepared. Tomorrow at 3 o'clock, at 3 p.m., the Agency of Commerce and Community Development will host a webinar to go over application details and also provide a demonstration mm -hmm. on how to fill it out. You can get more information and find out how to join at accd.vermont.gov. And with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for this week's modeling presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and good morning, everyone. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to intensify across our country, breaking records on a near continuous basis. Today, cases have never been higher in the United States, with the country averaging close to a quarter million new cases on a daily basis. 
Hospitalizations continue to rise, with more people being treated for COVID-19 than in any other previous time. And most regrettably, U.S. deaths from COVID-19 continues at a tragic pace, continuing to be one of the leading causes of death in our country, and now averaging over 3,000 people dying from the virus every single day. Looking at our regional data, we are unfortunately seeing some similar trends. This week, the Northeast reported over 200,000 cases, a 17% rise in new cases compared to last week's total, and also the single largest week of cases so far during the pandemic. With many of the states around us seeing the impact from the holidays on their case counts. However, we did see a considerable increase in regional testing this week as testing returned to a more normal pre-holiday level. Even with the increase in cases, the considerable increase in testing did drive down the regional positivity rate, although it is still above the 5% level recommended by the World Health Organization. Hospitalizations across the region are also high and trending higher. The seven-day average is higher than at any point during the recent surge, with close to 13,000 individuals hospitalized across New England and New York. Here in Vermont, we're also seeing cases increase, yesterday passing the 9,000 case threshold since the start of the pandemic. And this week, we recorded 1,166 new COVID-19 cases here in Vermont, about 400 more cases than we did last week, and a record number throughout the pandemic. To help put the recent case growth into perspective and also put the current risk into perspective, imagine that over the last five days, Vermont has reported more cases than it did for the entire months of May, June, July, August, and September combined. We have also seen our case growth accelerate during a period that would suggest uh, we are experiencing a holiday surge. Looking at the period following Christmas and comparing that to two previous holidays, Halloween, where we did experience a surge in cases, and Thanksgiving, where we did not see a surge, you'll see that that 10 to 17 day period following Christmas is tracking very closely to Halloween, with the only major difference being that Christmas started at a higher level of cases. Turning now to what this all means for Vermont's forecast in the weeks ahead, we are now forecasting a trajectory for cases that will continue to rise until early February, possibly even approaching 300 cases a day on average. But again, as we have emphasized many times before and as the governor emphasized in his open re opening remarks, the decisions that we all make today, both large and small, uh, following the public health guidance uh, and doing all of those things to protect ourselves and our families and our communities will help ensure uh, that we beat this estimated forecast. Importantly, we remain confident that even with the recent increase in cases and the projected growth in cases over the next few weeks, that our hospitals will have the necessary resources to treat those who need care. First, I want to show the type of sustained growth that might actually challenge our hospital capacity. Even though we're trending higher in cases, averaging about 166 uh, on a, a current day on average, we would actually need to be uh, averaging close to 380 cases a day over a 14-day period of time. So not 380 cases in a single day, and we've never approached that number, but 380 cases a day over a 14-day period to approach the level of ICU capacity here in Vermont. Again, that's growth that's far beyond what we're experiencing today, and it's beyond what we expect to experience uh, if our forecasted trends continue. Again, showing our hospital forecast, we can see again with even that increase in, hospital, an increase in, in case growth and higher cases forecasted, we're projected to remain within our current hospital capacity. And although much of the information we discussed today might be encouraging to some, uh, I again want to remind Vermonters that your sacrifices continue to have a major impact. When you measure our pandemic response across key indicators, Vermont remains in the top three states in the country. And when we uh, look to the vaccine administration, we continue to see that Vermont stands out on the pace it's administering vaccine. 
New data released yesterday by the CDC ranks Vermont first in the Northeast, tied with Connecticut on doses administered on a per capita basis, and we're currently tied uh, for sixth in the country. Given the sobering information uh, that we talked about in today's presentation, and also the great hope that the vaccine gives to end the pandemic, it's critical that every Vermonter continues to step up and goes and gets the vaccine when it's your turn to do so. And at this time, I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you. I'll start with our case update this morning. While well, yesterday we, pro we reported 109 cases, today we're reporting 167 cases and two additional deaths. Our positivity rate is at 2.7%. And as you saw, that is best in the nation. There are currently 51 people in the hospital 10 in the ICU. The range we're seeing in numbers of hospitalized patients continues to be higher recently, but as Commissioner Pichak just noted in his presentation, we continue to remain within our capacity and we are monitoring the situation in our hospitals very closely. As I said last week, we've seen our daily case counts show some effects from the holidays, most notably post-Christmas, when more people were more likely to travel and gather with others. We saw this uptick in counts on days 8 to 14 after the holiday. We are still waiting for more data to determine whether New Year's Eve had any significant impact, though we're just a few days shy of the 14 now. I had also mentioned that our contact tracing teams have identified several multifamily gatherings that had potential for further spread. But so far, we are still not finding evidence of significant outbreaks tied to the types of small gatherings that were allowed for the holidays. We see far more evidence of abundant isolated cases that have come from the community. We're currently investigating or monitoring 44 outbreaks and investigating or monitoring 344 situations, 42 of which were added yesterday, with the majority being in long-term care facilities that we have already been sharing with you and in non-healthcare work sites. We need to remember that when we don't see people who seem sick and we are going about our daily lives, more people do have the virus in our communities right now. And that means it can show up at workplaces, schools, healthcare facilities. I have oft quoted science that indicates that asymptomatic transition, transmission can occur in up to 40% of cases. Well now, some believe and are reporting that the true number may be as high as 50%. That's half of the cases. So my words of wisdom to you are be careful, be safe, and be alert at all times. That's why everywhere we need to go, we need to commit to looking for masks on faces, six-foot spaces, uncrowded places. We still need to avoid travel and getting together with anyone that we don't live with. We should always monitor ourselves for symptoms, literally take a moment and think how you're feeling, and be sure to get tested after any gathering or possible exposure to someone who has COVID-19. Now, none of this guidance I've just stated is new, but it's even more essential as we keep an eye on developments around this new, more transmissible variant of the virus, the so-called B117, that has now been found in 10 states, including Connecticut and New York. And looking nationwide, we see a percent positivity average of almost 14%, deaths that are up 19% in the past week, and the seven-day average for hospitalizations is up 6%. Many believe the variant is already circulating and we should expect to see it in Vermont. I've been one of those, though we still do not have any confirmed cases of it here. 
Our state public health laboratory continues to work with the UVM laboratory on developing ways to more rapidly perform genome sequencing and be a little bit ahead of the CDC who are only randomly sampling some of our specimens. Current estimates are that this variant, the so-called UK variant, is 50 percent more transmissible than the current virus. It won't make you necessarily more sick, but it may mean more people will get COVID-19 and need medical care. And more of the population will need to be vaccinated, further stressing this early stage of vaccinations. The other significant world variant, the South African, has yet to be seen in the United States. On the vaccine front, our teams continue their hard work planning for the next phases of vaccination as they expand by age grouping and high-risk conditions. We plan to have more details to share later this week on these and on how Vermonters can register for appointments when they are eligible. In addition to health department communications, we'll work with partners such as healthcare practices, pharmacies, employers, and local news media. And depending upon the metric used, as you saw on the slides just now, Vermont remains among the top states in the country for the percentage of doses administered. And we currently are almost at 25 doses administered for just the first dose, plus an additional number of people have already received the second dose. This is all the more the reason why we need to keep taking all the same steps to protect ourselves from the virus and keep it from spreading as we wait for the vaccine to become available to more and more Vermonters. Now, you've heard me say that we're watching hospitalizations very closely. And you've heard me talk in the past about monoclonal antibody therapy as a means to prevent a subset of high-risk outpatients from ever becoming hospitalized patients. The therapy has support from one major study, but has not been widely endorsed as a standard of care due to a lack of full endorsement by some medical research and clinical organizations, including the NIH and the Infectious Disease Society of America. The therapy also requires specialized infusion centers for patients who are COVID positive, which is admittedly a heavy lift for some hospitals. Nonetheless, about half of our Vermont hospitals have requested and already administered doses of monoclonal antibodies from our federal allocation. Perhaps others will gain interest at this delicate time in the pandemic when hospitals are admitting more COVID patients, should they feel that the risk-benefit ratio seems appropriate for the patient at hand. And along these same lines, a small randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial in Argentina indicated that early plasma therapy may be of benefit in older patients with mild COVID disease. This is so-called convalescent plasma, presumably rich in antibodies against COVID-19. This plasma during the early stage of the pandemic led to a significant reduction in the rate of development of severe respiratory symptoms in those who were treated. There were no significant adverse effects of the therapy. The researchers concluded that high titer convalescent plasma can reduce progression of COVID-19 in older adults with mild illness if administered within 72 hours of symptom onset. We'll see how much impact this has on practice in the US. I mention these treatments to let you know that there are still advances being made in the treatment of COVID-19, treatments that can still have a significant impact not only on hospitalizations, but on real people, while we wait for the slow process of vaccinating on a large population level in a time of scarce vaccine. I'll turn it back to the governor now. With that, we'll open up to questions. All right, we'll start in the room with Calvin. Um, thank you, Governor. Um, the FBI, state, and local police, as you know, are, are tracking potentially armed protests in all 50 states. 
including here in Vermont. Um, I guess first off, are, are you concerned about this? And, and what is your message to Vermonters that may want to attend this weekend? Um, well, first of all, I, I'm concerned, obviously, about the safety of Vermonters every single day. Uh, and this uh, potential uh, gathering, this protest uh, that uh, is being planned is something that has our attention. I've been briefed on it. Uh, I'll have uh, Commissioner Sherling um, provide some remarks on this as well. Um, my message uh, to Vermonters who want to participate, obviously, uh, it's your right. First Amendment right uh, to gather and protest and uh, and make your uh, your feelings known, um, but um, but I would say uh, don't be played, uh, don't be used as a pawn uh, by some of this ex these extreme groups uh, that are planning these protests throughout our nation uh, to undermine our democracy, um, to overthrow the government, and uh, they're using some of of those who have strong feelings, uh, but not the, the strength of, uh, of those who are, are planning these uh, uprisings. Uh, they're using them as pawns. They use them in, in Washington, and they'll use them uh, in the next few days. So I would just uh, ask them to be aware of their surroundings and uh, don't be used. Uh, Commissioner? Thank you, Governor. Uh, I think the Governor hit the high points. We're in close coordination with federal, state, and local authorities to plan for any eventuality. At this point, there are no specific indica indications of disruptions anticipated uh, in Vermont. Uh, but at the, as the Governor said, there are those who clearly demonstrated last week uh, their intent on, uh, on insurrection. And we don't want, as Vermonters, to fall into a trap of uh, of coming and in inadvertently uh, supporting that. So while we don't script where and when folks should exercise their First Amendment rights, um, we would ask that people you know, think twice about whether these two days that have been identified, the 17th and the 20th, are the right times to do that and maybe rethink um, exercising those, those rights at a different time. Governor, have, have uh, you know, state leaders on a frequent basis received threats um, in, in recent weeks leading up to now, have, have you received more threats than usual? Um, we don't typically comment on threats that I receive, um, albeit uh, there are threats that come in, but um, we don't comment on that. And then the last question having to do with the vaccine, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, you were still on track to vaccinate the, uh, Group 1A by the end of the month. Um, what concrete, uh, or I guess, how exactly will the next group of people, the 75 plus, how will they know? And what, what will that outreach look like when it's their turn? Yeah, we'll be able to uh, present that plan to you. I believe we're going to do it on Friday. I may ask Secretary Smith if that's correct. Are you planning to, uh, to unveil that plan on Friday, Secretary Smith? Yes, Governor. Um, on Friday, we'll, we'll do the outlines of the plan for the next uh, phase in terms of uh, 75 plus. Yeah, it'll be fairly simple though, Calvin. I mean, in terms of uh, the age banding, that's what makes it uh, so unique in some ways that anyone 75 and over uh, will be able to receive the vaccine and it'll be on a number of different platforms and that's what Secretary Smith will lay out on Friday. Thank you. All right, uh, we're gonna move to Steve, but just a note that there are 24 uh, folks in the queue, so please keep your questions. Mine actually will be quick. I think it probably is for the doctor, but uh, have we seen any uh, adverse reactions to in the state so far to the virus itself, or to, to the virus, to the uh, vaccine itself? So yes, I've heard of several people who had to be transported to an emergency room. I don't know the details of those. Um, but the answer is yes. Uh, but a, seriousness of but those? a very small number compared to over 25,000 doses. Right. Um, treatment with epi or? I'm not aware of the details. Okay. Very good. Thanks. But that is the reason we have a 15-minute observation period and 30-minute observation period for anyone who's had a history of anaphylaxis. All right. Moving to the phones, we'll go to Wilson at the AP. 
Um, hi, morning, everybody. Um, Dr. Levine, I've asked variations on this question before, but I'm curious, now that people are starting to be vaccinated, especially in the long-term care facilities, are you starting to see a tailing off of cases in those long-term care facilities that would indicate the vaccines are actually working? So the simple answer to that uh, would be that it's too soon to see that happen because even after a dose is administered, it's going to be a seven, 10 day or plus period to build up the immune response to that first dose. So, um, you know, if we look, we're in the second week of January now, and a lot of this happened late December and is continuing through January. So it's a little soon for that to have an impact. It's also why we don't uh, state that vaccination is a remedy to an outbreak in a facility. Uh, once an outbreak's occurred, there's a lot of uh, transmission that can be asymptomatic that occurs. And though it would seem to make sense that vaccinating everybody quickly would help, the problem is the body's immune system doesn't understand that and still takes time. So it's usually not a great response to an outbreak. I can say though that when you look at our uh, table of outbreaks, you're not seeing significant growth in many of the facilities. Many of the facilities are on there because we follow them for two incubation periods after their last case. And they, that means 28 days, which is a long time period but you're not seeing a tremendous amount of growth in most of the outbreaks that we've had recorded previously. So that happened, I have you're to say, a little ahead of the vaccine as well as while we've been vaccinating. So that's favorable news. And if we can prevent new facilities from becoming added to that list because of the haste with which we're trying to address all of the long-term cares, the skilled nursing facilities, the assisted living, and the residential care, then that will have been a great success. So if, if this is, um, you know, and hoping it will be successful, wouldn't you expect within, I don't know how long it would be, but those cases in the long-term care facilities would drop down to, well, I don't know, almost zero? Oh, yeah. And how yes. long do you think that should take? Yeah, eventually. But again, knowing that you get your first dose, you build up a certain immune response. Three weeks later for the Pfizer vaccine, you get your second dose, and then you need to build up the immune response to that. We're talking still six, eight weeks after your very first dose. So um, that would be, you know, through the month of February and later. But yeah. I like okay. your optimistic tone, and, and we should keep with that with regards <laughs> to what we're doing here. Well, I, I'm seeing, looking for some data to back up the optimistic tone. Thank you very much. Kat, WCAX. Hi. We've seen reports out of other states that some vaccine doses had to be tossed because they couldn't get them into people's arms fast enough. Has Vermont had to discard any vaccines? I'm not aware of any uh, that we've had to discard. Um, Dr. Levine? Yeah, I don't have a firm piece of data on that, but I'm not aware of any. And in fact, you know, we have weekly and several times a week discussions with our uh, hospital systems, and they make every effort at the end of a day. If there's vaccine left over, they literally will Ooh. run the vaccine up to one of the floors in the hospital from their clinic and say, who hasn't been vaccinated yet? We've still got some doses left over. So all efforts are being made to use those doses. Um, and you're right, we should have literally no doses being thrown away because of uh, lack of use. Uh, or spoilage because they exceeded their uh, time out of the, free, the frozen state. Um, but that, I'm not aware of uh, hardly anything in that category. That's good to hear. Um, I was running some numbers last night off the CDC's website. It appears that we're about 48% or so of our distributed vaccines actually making it into people's arms. I know last week we were at about 58%. What is the reason for the drop in the percent of vac vaccines administered? 
Not sure I can give you a reason, um, unless Secretary Smith has one that he's aware of, because uh, what we've done with the long-term cares is accelerated the rate with which they're getting vaccines into arms. Unfortunately, we can't always accelerate their rate of reporting, and they are, you know, with their contract with the federal partners, can have up to 72 hours to report those doses. So some of it may be a lag in reporting. Um, otherwise, uh, I know that when they are administered by the healthcare facilities, the report is within 24 hours for sure. Um, so I, I can't give you an explanation, though fortunately, as you saw in the data, we're still one of the leading states. Okay. Sorry, did I cut you off? No. You know, one, one thing you'll see as we make a transition uh, from the 1A category to our next phase with the uh, oldest Vermonters is that we will certainly not allow appointments to be left empty at the end of 1A and just wait to do 1B when 1A is completely done, there will be a overlap period where the finishing up of 1A is occurring while the initiation of 1B is occurring. Because uh, clearly we don't want to hold on to vaccine that comes into the state and not utilize it quickly. All right, thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Commissioner Levine, uh, first maybe just if we can get an update on our request that we made to the health department more than a week ago to get specific statistical reports like we've gotten in the past about where the outbreaks are and how many. Uh, is there any uh, that report going to be forthcoming? Can you give us an update on that? Yes, I'm aware that you're go <laughs> that that. The same process has to be gone through each time you get a report, but you're getting the reports. Well, we haven't gotten any. We didn't get any last week. We haven't gotten any this week. Right. So I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah, you will. You you will be getting the reports. Any idea on the time frame on that? Uh, I I don't have that awareness at this time. No. Okay. So for today, uh, we continue to get reports of Vermonters unable to get tested easily. Uh, got another email yesterday of somebody from a reader in the islands that noted a close friend was working alongside a man that tested positive over the weekend, and the reader tried unsuccessfully to get tested. She was with a friend for three days, so she thought due to her age and situation and whatever, she'd call the uh, health center to get tested and was told that because she did not have obvious symptoms on Monday, she could not have a test. She did have a sore throat, I guess, over the weekend, but was better on Monday. She was told she could wait online, go online and wait two or three days for an appointment. And she just says, quote, just want you to know that it's not as easy as they make it sound to get tested. Is there any help for these kind of people? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not. You said she called the health center, so I'm I'm, I'm interpreting that as a, a clinical setting. Um, Correct. Which which is fine, um, and they probably said what they needed to say, which is uh, they weren't going to order a test for her because she didn't have symptoms, because that's what they would normally do. But that's only one phone call she made. Uh, we would much rather she had either gone on our website or made the phone call to the health department where there's a complete listing of all the facilities available to her in her uh, catchment area, we'll call it, uh, that she could travel to and she could actually register for ahead of time and have an appointment. They would also tell her what day might be the most useful day for her because depending on when her exposure was, uh, it's not necessarily that same day or the next day later that would optimize her getting a test. It might be a number of days later after she's had a chance to um, incubate if she was going to be infected and then test positive before her symptoms developed. So all of that could have happened 
that is happening for thousands of Vermonters every day. Um, so I, I wouldn't want her unfortunate experience to uh, be the model for what people think happens. Because uh, since we've really uh, launched all of the sites around the state, we've heard really very good feedback and um, been very um, receptive to the needs of Vermonters to go to a test setting as an asymptomatic person, get the test done, and get a result back within a 48-hour period. All right, we're going to move to Joe at the bar. Okay, can I, I, I only got one question in. Yeah, that was. I'm on four, Mike. No, I'm there was a follow-up. It was a follow-up from not reporting. That's a question. I had a quick question for Secretary Curley. There are 19 people left in the queue, so please, if you have any I'll be more quick. Uh, yep, uh, bingo is Secretary Curley, I assume. Bingo is starting apparently this week locally, and ice fishing derbies are starting. What rules do you have for these kind of gatherings, for these kind of events? Um, that, those are great questions. Uh, we have a, a variety of guidance on our website. I'd be happy to try to, to walk through this with folks. Um, bingos are a really tough one. Um, clubs are closed right now, so depending on what the environment is, we are would be very concerned about people um, being properly spaced. Uh, so big concern there. The ice fishing, again, a little bit um, more comfortable outdoors, and Dr. Levine could probably speak better to that. But as well, um, you know, we, we don't necessarily have something on bingo and something on ice fishing, fishing but the guidance can pertain to them. So happy to, happy to help if, if there's folks that are thinking about starting up a, a, an area. There should be no tournament, um, no competition. So that will, you know, create another, another uh, hurdle for folks to, to think about when they're planning, you know, whatever they're, I, I don't want to call it an event because it makes me a little bit concerned, but I'm happy to help. Great. Thank you very much. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Uh, I believe this question is for Dr. Levine. Um, there are two vaccines that are currently uh, have an emergency approval and presumably more on the way. Um, is there a difference between them that affects who should be getting a vaccine, a particular vaccine, and a mechanism to make sure that um, people are matched? correct vaccine in that case. What were the last few words you said? People are... Uh, I think I caught it, Joe, that people are get... It, it, there's a difference in who matched. should get which vaccine yeah. if they're matched accordingly. Yeah. So, so the two vaccines that are available are, of course, the Pfizer and the Moderna. And these two vaccines are very similar in terms of the technology that went into them. There's really not been any major differentiation of which vaccine might be preferable for one audience or another. The only difference is a two-year age gap, where one is uh, licensed for 16 and above, the other is for 18 and above. But if we ignore that minor difference, um, there's really no one that is best for one setting versus another setting. We've chosen to use the Pfizer in the long-term care settings due to the fact that the pharmacies were very well equipped with the appropriate uh, freezer uh, and the temperature that vaccine required. Um, it is important, we still believe, and this has not been proven to be otherwise yet, so this is still what everyone should hear, that if you got dose one of Pfizer, you get dose two of Pfizer. If you got dose one of Moderna, you get dose two of Moderna, and there's no crossover. And then finally, potentially at the end of this month or into February, we may hear about one or two other vaccines that um, get put in front of the FDA's uh, advisory committee for uh, potential emergency use authorization. But um, I don't want to overpromise anything that's out of my control, but we're hearing late January, early February, potentially for another vaccine. Uh, 
I've also heard that there's a possibility that uh, the new administration will be releasing much larger quantities of vaccines to the state. Uh, will that uh, present uh, a problem to Vermont in making sure that they're um, used properly? That's a problem we'd love to have. Um, it was just announced this morning that uh, they may not withhold the second dose anymore, but send it all uh, initially. We don't really have any real details on anything except that one line, so I can't say much more. Um, we still believe that people who get a first dose should get the second dose at the right time, so it'll change the bookkeeping into what we do as opposed to what the federal government's doing. But um, if we got larger allocations, we would be delighted because, you know, the plans we have that you'll hear about later this week, you know, involve a variety of potential places for people to get their vaccine, some very large community vaccination sites. Um, and in order to do justice across the state and to all of the different settings, you need enough vaccine to distribute. So uh, I'll just say bring it on. Thank you. Thank you. And Newport Daily Express. Yeah, I want to dig just a little deeper into the logistics of distribution. Obviously, it's easy to distribute to a hospital or a nursing home or, or home care facility. Uh, when it comes to seniors who are at home and they're affiliated, for example, with the home health care agency, are they going to get the vaccine through home health care? Um, if a person is, say, 60 years old and they have some serious pre-existing conditions, how will they know when they're eligible when you talk about 75 age group plus? Is their family doctor's office going to notify them they're eligible? Can you just give me a little more on the logistics of how people are going to know and, and have access to the vaccine? Yeah, Ed, uh, you're about three days too early. Uh, we'll have those, uh, those details, um, details on Friday. Um, so Secretary Smith will be going into some of those details, hopefully flush this out a little bit more uh, so that it becomes clear uh, for those who are interested in uh, when they might be able to get their, their vaccinations. So um, wait till Friday. Okay, I'll have to check in then. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. Uh, hi. Um, Levine, could you quickly just clarify what you mean by changing your bookkeeping in Vermont? Are you saying that even if they uh, release all these vaccine doses at once intended to vaccinate more people with the first dose? Vermont would just continue on with its first-dose, second-dose strategy? I, th I, th I think what uh, Dr. Levine had said that the CDC and the Biden administration had come out with new details about what they were going to do, but we haven't received all those details, uh, just the headlines. And the headlines aren't always exactly what happens. Okay, but in general, does Vermont uh, believe that they should kind of keep with the philosophy of making sure everyone gets the second dose, um, you know, in the regularly scheduled time. Again, I'll let Dr. Levine answer, but from my perspective, um, we had uh, committed to Vermonters uh, that we we're going to have a second dose uh, ready for them at 21 or 28 days, and I believe we should follow through on that promise and, and the strategy that we rolled out to begin with. So. We'll, we don't know what flexibility we'll have, um, but hopefully we'll have the, the flexibility to do what we think is right. I think giving the second dose is what the, would be the right path forward. And uh, I'll go on record as agreeing with that. I don't have much more to say about it. The fact of the matter is it follows the science. If we're gonna believe in the efficacy of the vaccine, we should use it the way it was used in the studies that we're uh, using to uh, use it in the first place um, and not be experimenting on the state of Vermont's population. Okay. Um, also, uh, 
So contact tracing seems to show that family gatherings aren't responsible for the latest surge. Um, Scott, do you think that your listing of the band had any part of the, the latest case numbers? Um, do you have any theories as to why this surge is happening now when it didn't really happen after Thanksgiving? Um, well, obviously there were more people getting together. Um, we had, uh, I think Dr. Levine had said earlier uh, that uh, we are seeing some multiple, multiple uh, family gatherings uh, that have been uh, been part of the concern, and we've contact traced to, to some of those. But uh, the the single uh, family gatherings with one other trusted family uh, hasn't we haven't seen any connection there. Um, so obviously, more people are getting together um, at Christmas and New Year's than they were uh, uh, during Thanksgiving. Okay, now I understand. So what you're saying is, you know, two family trusted household gatherings like you allowed for were not responsible. It's more that there were families that defied even those restrictions and had more people. That's that's what we're finding. Uh, we haven't been able to contact trace back to any that I know of, of, uh, of one other trusted family. But uh, there is more community spread, as Dr. Levine has said. Dr. Levine? Yeah, in addition to all of what the governor just said, um, we did have a modest outbreak in the Bennington area we've talked about before that seems to have run its course, I would think, uh, certainly not adding tremendous cases there. And we did have the Addison County Church Services. Uh, that outbreak is still growing. Um, the number is close to 100 now um, that are affected by that outbreak. So we have a few that we can actually say occurred related to uh, people gathering during uh, the holiday period, but we don't have abundant data to say that there were a lot of people going outside the bounds of the guidance that was provided during the holidays. As Commissioner Pichak's okay. data, as Commissioner Pichak's data showed us on the slide, we are, we began Christmas at a higher baseline level. Uh, much different than Halloween when uh, we were just coming out of the summer and early fall um, and the level in the state was much lower uh, compared to where it was right before the Christmas holiday. Okay, thank you very much. Andrea, seven days. Hi there. Um, just to follow up on, on the vaccination, the kind of federal policy on vaccination um, questions, um, do, do these um, forthcoming recommendations on, um, on just vaccinating everyone who's over the age of 65 change anything um, or might they change anything about how the state um, is going to approach this age banding plan? Um, at this point, we, uh, we want to continue uh, with our approach, uh, 75 and over. Uh, we'll get more details. Uh, uh, Dr. Levine had said that this was just released this morning, uh, so we don't have all the details from the CDC at this point, but uh, it's our hope that we'll continue uh, to do the age banding from 75 and over uh, starting, I believe, uh, sometime next week, but we'll go into more details on, uh, on Friday. Um, and um, does does it change to not holding back those um, those uh, extra doses um, give the state more flexibility to kind of speed up the process? Um, and and is it possible that we would reach future phases faster? No, um, you know, and, and <laughs> again, I'll let yeah. Dr. Levine answer this. But it, these the vax the vaccines uh, were implemented uh, with two doses to get the highest effective rate. So if we disregard that, um, the science doesn't tell us that it'd be all that effective. And we don't know how effective it would be, actually, uh, because I don't think they did any testing on that and did any research on what a single dose would do. So that's why we uh, would like to, if we're able to, uh, continue to advocate for everyone that uh, that is uh, within the, the time frame uh, to get their second dose. 
uh, because it'll be more effective at that point. So, Dr. Levine, anything more? I guess I'm, yeah. I'm just curious about whether the the sort of state versus federal managing of those logistics will will change um, sort of how fast the state is able to administer. Yeah. No. We obviously, as the governor alluded to, we just don't have any of the fine details. All we have is a headline at this point in time for both um, more doses coming in and the government not withholding the second dose early on and for the over 65. Um, keep in mind, though, from last week's slides where we showed you the case fatality rate by age, and it's still true that if you're over 75, your case fatality rate is significantly higher than if you're 65. Uh, so, again, the goal for everyone, whether it's one set of guidance or another, is to save lives and do that as quickly as possible. So we have a method of doing that that we'll outline for you on Friday. Um, it's not any different than what the government is saying. The government is just saying, basically, make sure you get older people done as a priority because we want to save lives. And we have a methodical way of approaching that. Um, okay. And, and do you know anything about um, next week's shipment volume yet uh, and whether you'll be getting the expected um, amount of doses or, or whether that will change? Yeah, we usually don't at this time, but I'm going to ask Secretary Smith if he has any awareness that, that I don't have yet. No, Dr. Levine, I don't. Uh, we usually don't have it until about midweek, um, an insight into what's coming in next week. Okay. Um, thank you. Again, having said all that, um, if they start ramping up and giving us the more supply, um, first of all, we'll have enough for the second dose uh, for those folks that are uh, on within the 21-day uh, period or the 28-day period. So it might be a natural type of evolution uh, to the second dose. So we'll have to just wait and see what they're planning, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll receive uh, a much larger supply in the future and it'll continue to grow so that we can put more shots in arms. That's our, that's our goal. And we'll be able to ramp up for it as well with a plan we're putting into place on Friday uh, it's easily, uh, we're easily able to ramp up from there. Okay, we'll move to Lisa at the Valley Reporter. Hello, I'd like to ask Secretary Smith and Secretary French about their responses to a January 8th release from the Vermont NEA that questioned why ski patrollers engaged in a, quote, leisure activity, unquote, were getting vaccines before teachers. I'll take that first because I answered the question if, um, from, from you last time, Lisa. I said if those were medical personnel that were falled, fell under the category of uh, EMS or first responders, uh, then they, were, they could get vaccinated. Um, what has, uh, I thought it got a little bit twisted because if those people uh, are going to get vaccinated anyway um, because of their qualifications and as the fact that they are providing medical services. So um, I answered it the way that I think it should have been answered, and I thought it was, I think it's appropriate that these are medical personnel that are providing medical services and have certifications to prove that they are medical personnel and they uh, are entitled to the vaccine. Thank you, Secretary Smith. To be, to be clear, the word leisure, engaged in a leisure activity were not mine. They came from the Vermont NEA. Secretary French? Yeah, I would just echo on that, that um, as first responders, obviously, they're like more likely to encounter uh, individuals who might be uh, contagious. So uh, in that, that perspective, it makes sense to me in terms of their categorization. Yeah, if it was. Um, Thank you very much, Lisa. I, Lisa, it was a bit misleading mm -hmm. uh, the statement in some respects because these, some of these ski patrol, are EMS first. 
you know, and uh, they might perform other duties on the weekends and so forth. Uh, but they go through other uh, training. They are already, they, they are, um, their other jobs uh, might entail being on the, uh, the emergency transport or first responders in their own communities. So it's just unfortunate that it was characterized in that way. Did anyone at the state level respond to the Vermont NEA in its January 9th release? I didn't see that, uh, Lisa, but, um, but I'll ask Secretary French or Secretary Smith if they responded or know of anybody that, who did or whether it was a, a question. Maybe it was just a statement. Uh, Governor, Secretary French, uh, we did not respond to it. But the Agency of Education did not respond. And, uh, uh, Governor, neither did I. Okay. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, uh, Governor. I was going to ask an exciting financial question, but let me follow up on what Lisa was saying. It, you know, at the end of last week and at Friday's press conference, there was a lot of questions related to who's going to be in the second group, and I know you're going to release this information on Friday in a, more detail, but there's a lot of lobbying going on and a lot of questions and reasonable questions about if someone has underlying health conditions. And so it's not just the teachers, it's other other groups or other people who might um, think they are reasonably um, able. And I'm wondering what you would say to these other people in these other groups who think they should be in uh, this second wave and, and how, it, like Mike Smith was also asked about um, uh, people with underlying health conditions and about firefighters, et cetera, et cetera. And what, what do you say to people who, who want to jump into that group? Well, the, the underlying conditions, uh, we are going to be able to describe who would be in that, that grouping. Uh, there will be uh, some with underlying conditions that will be in phase two, along with the 75 and over. Um, I, I would just point back to the, to the data. The data tells us who's most vulnerable, who's at risk of dying if they get COVID. And those over 75 are at much greater risk of dying from COVID than those over 70. Those over 70 are much higher risk than those over 65. And those over 65 are at much higher risk than those under 50, let's say. So, you know, if we want, we can make an argument, I think, for almost anyone. Everyone is essential in some, some manner throughout Vermont in the, in the careers, the jobs they, they have on a daily basis. But we know who, who is susceptible to dying. And that's our goal right here, is just to make sure that we prevent as many deaths as possible as we get through this. If we have more of the vaccine, we will get them into the arms of everyone. If we had enough, we would, we would line people up and, uh, and make sure that they had uh, vaccinations, but we don't. We have a limited supply, so we have to prioritize. And I would say uh, those at risk of dying come first. We have a moral obligation to take care of them like they took care of us. All right, great. Thanks, Governor. Matt, WPTZ. Matt? Thank you. Uh, yep, sorry about that. Um, this question, I think, is for Commissioner Sherling. Um, while there hasn't been any um, that you've made aware, any um, any possible um, armed demonstrations um, at the State House, um, if there are any, how 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 do you go about protecting and making sure people have the right to protest, but also make sure that everyone is safe, especially if the calls are for possible armed protest. Thanks for the question. Uh, I think all you have to do, um, uh, assuming nothing um, like uh, last Wednesday happens, is to look back on uh, how Vermont uh, has handled these in the past. It's not uncommon or unheard of to have protests uh, that relate to Second Amendment rights where people are armed, other types of protests where people are armed but are peaceful, um, and there is a well-established uh, playbook for how to handle that. 
uh, in terms of responding to specifically to how we'll handle uh, any eventuality um, both this weekend and, and beyond. Um, that's not something that we're in a position to discuss the details of for obvious reasons. Okay. And another question I had is we're hearing reports that um, gun sales are up in the state. And I believe you said yesterday that uh, there's, you heard about a possible Second Amendment um, rally on Sunday. Do you have any concerns um, about the increase in gun sales in the state and the possible um, the rally that could could happen. No specific concerns relative to gun sales. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday on a media call, uh, that's not uncommon with a change of administration in Washington. Um, that's a typical uptick that happens, although I am not familiar with uh, specific statistics around gun sales uh, in Vermont. Uh, if they do exist, it's just not information that I have at this point. Um, the sale of, of weapons, possession of weapons, is something that has a long history in Vermont, and uh, you know, sp sportsmen have uh, long demonstrated responsible gun ownership. It's when you see uh, guns used for nefarious purposes in crime that we get concerned. So it's how they're used, uh, less um, the fact that they were sold. Great. And then, um, any either for you, Commissioner Sherling or Governor Scott, um, are you aware? Has the National Guard been called to Washington D.C. at all? Um, ahead of uh, the inauguration next week at all? Uh, no. The answer of Vermont National Guard, no. All right. Thank you. Greg, the county courier. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, good afternoon, Governor. Um, I understand that the legislature has not funded requests for riot gear and, and body cameras for Capitol Police in Vermont. Uh, with the recent insurrection, uh, do you think that this policy needs to be changed? Um, you know, we're reviewing uh, body cameras um, and we'll be presenting our budget next week or the week after. And, uh, you know, we're, we're contemplating, we'd like to see body cams on, on all law enforcement in Vermont. Um, as far as riot gear, I'm, I'm not sure that there's a need for riot gear with the Capitol Police. Okay, and just a quick follow-up. Um, in recent weeks, you've been pretty outspoken about this not being the time to increase revenue uh, in Vermont. Uh, are you committed, as you were in your first term in office, not to increase taxes and fees, at least during the recession or, or maybe even during the pandemic? Yeah, I just want to clarify. I'm all for raising revenue, um, just not by increasing taxes. Uh, I'd like to grow it organically with economic growth so we have more revenue. And I believe that we can do that. We had started down this path uh, before pre-pandemic. Uh, we were in a, good, in a fairly good position. Uh, in, in fact, uh, probably the best position we've been in in uh, decades. So um, it's just this pandemic uh, that is uh, has uh, caused us uh, some economic harm. Uh, thankfully, uh, the federal government, the Congress, Senator Leahy, uh, Senator Sanders, Congressman Welch, have been able to assist us in obtaining more resources uh, so that we can backfill uh, some of the, the impending needs that we have. This l latest package is going to be advantageous to Vermont. I believe we can get through this without increasing any taxes. Um, so I'm just as committed as I was the first year uh, to, that will be the last resort. Uh, we should not, what we need is more taxpayers, not more taxes. I'm just as committed today as I was uh, four years ago. Thank you, Governor. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Stewart, NBC5. Good afternoon. Uh, Governor, you, you've called for the president's resignation or removal. Uh, do you support impeachment? Yeah, I stand by what I said. I believe the the president should be held accountable um, for this insurrection. I believe he had a hand in it. And uh, I think we just have to look back through history as to why you have to follow the through. Um, this isn't, uh, obviously, uh, this isn't something that we should be condoning, uh, undermining our democracy. And, uh, and I believe that, uh, again, he was... Uh, had uh, a hand in this, um, if not a, a, a major role in this insurrection. 
And if I could ask whether any of the situations that Dr. Levine described uh, are yet associated with the bus trip to Washington last Wednesday. I don't believe that we've contact trace uh, anything back uh, to the bus trip last week. All right, thank you. Avery, WCAX. Governor, more than 40 senators and U.S. senators, including Senator Leahy and Senator Sanders, are calling on the Trump administration to have a more comprehensive COVID vaccination plan. Do you feel that the, that the federal government needs to have a more comprehensive plan, and what would your administration like to see out of that? You know, what I think we need is uh, we just need more vaccine. We need more supply. Uh, we can, uh, at least in our state, uh, we, we, we're comfortable with a plan that we're, uh, we're committed to. Um, I believe that we have a plan in place uh, and will be evolving over time where we get the shots in arms of, of those in need, but we just need more of the vaccine itself. So if there was a, if there's something that they could do uh, to, to, to uh, encourage the manufacturers uh, to produce the vaccine uh, in a more um, um, increased way, uh, that would be most beneficial to the states. But I don't need, you. you know, we're, we're too far down this path in some respects. Uh, we've got a plan in place that I believe will work and uh, all we need is the supply. So uh, for them to come in midstream and then uh, turn this on its head uh, wouldn't be advantageous to Vermont. Thank you. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, this is for Dr. Levine. Uh, these, for these two new variants that have shown up, are the vaccines available still effective against them? So the early word with the UK variant is that the vaccine will still be effective, but that's very early word and preliminary. It's all been very promising. I, I don't want to consider it 100% definitive yet, but we should be encouraged. With regard to the Saudi Arabia variant, um, that there is no awareness yet on that one. So I uh, can't comment on that one. How concerned are you that since we are seeing variants now that that we may see one that the vaccine doesn't work against and we'd essentially have to start from square one. Yeah, you know, that's a, a mild concern right now, but the longer time goes on, that could become a more major concern. And that's why the whole issue of rapid deployment of the vaccine is critical. It really is a race uh, against the clock in some sense because we know the current vaccine and what it is effective against. And we want to have more people vaccinated at a time when the virus is, the vac is what the vaccine was uh, made to be effective against, even with the variant that uh, will start to spread around the country here. So viruses do mutate, and we know that the longer things go on, the more likely it could be that other mutations occur that could become more prevalent. So the faster we can actually suppress this virus by vaccinating people and by um, making sure that everyone obeys all of the guidance and efforts to uh, not spread the virus from person to person, uh, the faster that goes, the better. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I was wondering if uh, there was any data or information about how many people in this first phase of vaccinations have, have refused to, to be vaccinated. Yeah, uh, Dr. Levine. Yeah, we don't have more than anecdotal data right now, uh, unfortunately. I know that the uptake in the residents of the long-term care facilities is quite high. Um, I don't know as much about the staff that work in those facilities. Anecdotally, those in healthcare facilities are pretty pleased with the uptake of the vaccine, but again, 
Um, we don't have the numbers yet to, to really give you. Uh, I'm hoping those will be forthcoming. It'll be a little bit challenging uh, to get them from such diverse groups, but that's what we're hoping to get. But can't, can't say much more. As I've been reading the national data, again, it's mostly filled with anecdotal reports. Uh, there were some spots in the country that actually looked quite alarming, like three in 10 of the healthcare workers were saying yes, and they would prefer to wait three or four months and see that things were fine before they started taking it. And then other parts of the country where it was literally nine in 10 were taking the vaccine. So it seems uh, very regional and challenging to really get at a official true data as opposed to just anecdotal reports. But that's what we have at this point. Okay. Um, and then I wanted to, to shift gears over to um, the, the Governor and Commissioner Sherling uh, to the comments that you made about the, these uh, potential rallies or, or events that are being planned. Um, you know, both of you sort of laid out that, you know, people's First Amendment right to gather. But, um, Governor, you've, you know, spoken out pretty strongly against sort of the the beliefs and sort of the disinformation and, and sort of the, the message that these people are, are gathering to talk about, which is that the election was somehow a fraud. So, you know, kind of moving aside from the First Amendment considerations, do you think that these people should be gathering right now? I mean, do, do you agree with what with what they're doing and, and the actions that that they're sort of that they're there to to raise awareness or that they're saying they're raising awareness about? You know, it's not clear to me exactly what the message is. I think it started out um, as a Second Amendment rally, uh, to be honest with you. Um, but then uh, there are these extremist groups uh, that have uh, started infiltrating and are using it for other reasons, a uh, multitude of reasons. And, and my fear is that they're, they're using law-abiding uh, citizens of Vermont and other states uh, who believe in the Second Amendment um, and, uh, and which I which I do as well, and um, and are using them as pawns in this scheme uh, to cause disruption, and to tear apart our democracy, and to overthrow the government, um, and and that's my biggest fear. I just want them to be aware of what they're doing and and the reasons uh, they're being asked to do it, and uh, and I think that that's uh, from my perspective that's uh, that's my biggest fear is that. Uh, Vermonters are being duped into uh, participating in this rally for the wrong reasons. Mr. Well, Sherman. then should they should they be showing up? Then I mean, I think well, you have the, you have a right to do it. Um, you know, I again, I'm advocating uh, for them to be aware of why uh, they're they're doing this. What's the reason? Um, and uh, and uh, and again, I just want them to go in with their eyes wide open. Obviously. Uh, we, uh, there have been other uh, protests throughout Vermont over the last year um, that have been uh, peaceful in nature. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, if they do gather on uh, these two dates, that it will be a peaceful rally. Okay, thank you. Cameron, the St. Albans Messenger. Hi, this is um, for Commissioner Levine. Um, we've heard some kind of anecdotal cases around the country of folks getting the first dose of the vaccine and then testing positive for COVID afterward. I was wondering if there have, I guess, A, have there been any such cases in Vermont that you've heard of? And B, if that does occur, does it have any, effect, any impact on the effectiveness of the vaccines? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. So yes, we have known of a few cases in Vermont and it gives me a great opportunity to tell people that just because the needle went in your arm on a Monday doesn't mean you can't be standing next to somebody with COVID on a Friday, not wear a mask, be, cl be too close to them, be in a crowded room with them and get COVID. So uh, it, it does happen and it's completely compatible with what we know about our body's ability to mount an immune response to the vaccine. So though I don't have widespread uh, events like I just described, uh, it has happened here. Um, generally, 
Uh, once you get COVID, we tell people uh, you should wait a period of time to, someone's gonna need to go on mute. Um, we generally tell people to wait a period of time to resolve that uh, so that they'll be able to mount the best immune response to the vaccine. Um, so it's a little bit of a changing landscape when it comes to having already received one dose and wondering about when you get the second dose, but we'd want people to certainly be out of that period of time when they're symptomatic um, and still fighting off the infection. And there is a little bit of flexibility. Right, so There's a little bit of flexibility in when one can get a second dose. Um, it's not a magical thing about the exact day of three weeks or four weeks. So uh, when it comes to people's lifestyles and convenience and when they can get to a, uh, a vaccine location, they could be a day or two ahead or a day or two behind, and that's not going to be the end of the world. So if, if someone finds himself in that instance, uh, would you recommend they quarantine and then just get the second dose as usual? And, or I guess what would you recommend for someone yeah, I, in that situation? Yeah, I, I think a lot of it's going to depend on exactly what their course was and what happened. So it might be more of an individual decision to make with their health care provider. Okay, thank you. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. Thank you. Um, Dr. Levine, this is uh, a bit of a continuation of what uh, Liam just asked. Um, a local hospital administrator here uh, has estimated that the total number of their employees that have signed up and will be vaccinated by the end of the first phase is going to be somewhere around mid-60s percentage-wise of their hospital staff. Uh, if that holds up as a vaccination rate, um, and especially translated to the general population, doesn't that drop us short of achieving herd immunity? And uh, what would be the consequences of, of falling short of those goals? Sure. So part A is, if it is in the mid-60s, what we've seen already is there are healthcare workers who have waited to the end of this 1A group uh, to actually step forward. In the beginning, they said they were hesitant. Um, and now that they've seen over a number of weeks, uh, events unfold, they're willing to take it. So I wouldn't say that our resting point is at the mid-60s for the group you've talked about. It could actually go higher just because of human behavior. The second thing is we don't actually know the herd immunity number. And, you know, even Dr. Fauci has sort of gone from 70 percent to 90 percent, and that's a fairly broad band. Um, and it's because we, we don't really have a good uh, way of assessing that except use of past experience with other viral uh, diseases and epidemics. So obviously we want to shoot for the highest that we can get and be realistic about that. We also think that even as the pandemic continues on, people will change their behaviors just like some of these healthcare workers in the first phases. And uh, as they see uh, over months and months things evolving, uh, their comfort level with uh, receiving the vaccine uh, might as well increase as well. So um, that's about all I can say. I think I answered all of your phases of the questions. Uh, if I didn't, I'd be happy to. What has um, been our most successful uh, vaccination rate for, uh, say, flu shot in any given year? Yeah, flu shot... Uh, Probably the most successful would be in the 60% range at the most, um, which isn't bad. Um, but obviously, you know, some of our very time-honored vaccines, uh, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, you know, we're way into the um, mid and upper 90%. So clearly, um, we can achieve those numbers. Okay. Uh, and if I may, of Secretary Smith, um, I understand AHS has put out a request for proposal for vaccination partners with a uh, deadline of January 25th. Just curious um, how this RFP process fits into the bigger picture and, and what the January 25 deadline means for um, uh, uh, timing on rolling out the larger vaccination effort. 
You're going to have to tune in on Friday there. Um, I think that is going to be part of the, some of the announcements that we're making. Understood. Thank you. Guy Page. Guy Page. Uh, Governor. Yes, uh, Governor. Uh, there's a lot of social media buzz that QAnon, one of the groups supposedly planning these state house protests, predicts President Trump will declare martial law. Uh, if he does, will you and the state of Vermont police cooperate? Um, I, I, I don't believe that President Trump will be declaring martial law. Okay. Uh, Let's say he does. Uh, let's, what would you do? Yeah, I'm not. I don't want to play that game, uh, guy, because I don't believe okay. it's going to happen. Okay. Thank you. Steve, any KTV? Hi. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, Governor, under uh, under the title, there's you know there's a few in every crowd. Uh, in the fall of '73, I went to a Grateful Dead show in Boston, and uh, a bunch of people without tickets had trashed the music hall, and uh, the rest of us came out after the end of a great concert and wound up being clubbed by uh, police on horseback like baby seals. And, uh, I mean, I watched that whole rally and, uh, that they, they held, and the president had specifically asked for uh, uh, peaceful and patriotic protests. So how can you blame someone? I mean, could you blame the Grateful Dead for putting on a concert? Uh, I mean, he, yeah, had, I, he, he I, didn't I, specifically ask for violence. Yeah, he did. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, he did. I mean, he just take some of the comments that he had made and Giuliani had made and Don Jr. had made um, pre-rally. Uh, uh, I would say this was more than a rally uh, when they break down uh, the, uh, the barriers uh, to the, the Capitol, break into the Capitol, break windows, and overwhelm uh, the Capitol Police. Uh, killing one officer uh, in particular. Oh, I saw it. I yeah. saw it. So I'm not sure that that uh, I'm not sure that's a peaceful uh, rally, and I don't think uh, that those statements that he made were made until afterwards. Um, before I didn't hear that out of his mouth. I, I beg to disagree, but I well, want you send. Thing why don't you send me? Finish. Why don't you send me that? clip where he did that before it, it, the rally the rally if he had asked for violence wouldn't that be like it on you know, those clips be on the news every night yeah i think i would advocate steve watch the impeachment trial uh and some of those clips might come out oh good grief uh i guess we'll have to uh, agree to disagree um, we will now, speaking of the media, uh, doc, uh, I've got a one for, uh, uh, for Dr. Levine, if I may. <clears throat> um, Dr. Levine, are, are we still using the uh, ICUs to, uh, to isolate people? I would say in general, the answer is no. There may be one or two specific cases. I, I don't have an awareness on the 10 patients I mentioned today. Uh, I would hope the answer is almost always no, but uh, there may be occasions in some of the smaller hospitals where that might occur. But like I said, it would be the minority of the people in the ICU. And, and um, with Moderna's vaccine, they say they have a 84% uh, success rate um, for, people, um, for people over 65. And, and with the number of patients that uh, have like allergies and stuff, and, and the, the, the higher number of people who, who get anaphylaxis or have anaphylactic shock um, after taking the, uh, taking the vaccine, um, 
shouldn't we re uh, wouldn't it be better to to recommend that the vaccine be administered in a in a hospital setting where you know in, in case somebody doesn't have like an EpiPen or or something on them yeah so you know uh we're, we're going to be very strict with uh how it's administered in vermont so it doesn't have to be in a hospital setting necessarily but clearly it has to be in a setting where there are personnel available who could administer an EpiPen or any other treatment needed. Um, admittedly, this is a rare event, but rare events can still happen. So we have to be prepared sure. for anything. Um, but um, one would want to have the very first intervention done uh, at the site of the vaccine, and it doesn't have to be in a hospital but clearly there should be ability to transport the patient to a hospital uh, if they did have a life-threatening reaction. And uh, that's the way uh, things will be done. Okay, we're gonna move to Courtney, Local 22. Courtney, Local 22. Okay, we're gonna to move to Tom at the Vermont Standard. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, this is Tom Harris, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my questions today related to uh, potential monitoring and contact tracing uh, related to the Trump rally bus trip last week and also to the proposed rally at the State House this weekend. So uh, all my questions have been addressed. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Thanks, Tom. That's it. Okay. Well, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll see you again on Friday.